Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be life histories and density regulation. So let me get you your objectives, and we'll get going. Three things that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video. First one, to describe the trade-offs inherent to various reproductive strategies. Second, compare and contrast forms of, pro of population regulation. And finally, explain the connection between predator and prey populations. So basically today we're talking about how populations grow and shrink and strategies that animals have to reproduce under certain conditions. So first topic for the day is going to be a life history. Now, when scientists talk about life histories, essentially what they're talking about is for an organism, when, it, when in its life cycle does it reproduce? So does it reproduce almost as soon as it's born? Does it mature, then reproduce? Basically, when in its life does it reproduce? How many times within its life will it reproduce? So one shot, one time, or several times? And how many kids will it have each time it does reproduce? So is it going to have big litters, thousands of eggs, whatever, or just like one baby? So when we talk about life history, it's all about when they reproduce, how many offspring they have, and how often they do it. Now, when we are talking about different life strategies, there's essentially two extremes when it comes to reproduction and then a lot of stuff in between. So I'm going to talk about the two extremes, but recognize that most animals fall somewhere in between these two extremes. So the first extreme is one shot. It's called similarity, and it's favored in harsh conditions. So animals that show similarity, basically what they do is they reproduce one time in their life, and they have a ton of offspring. A couple of examples. Got the salmon right there. Salmon are born at the headwaters of a stream, then they usually migrate to the open ocean, spend one to four years um, maturing in the ocean, then they will reach turn to their place of birth, lay thousands of eggs, and die. So those thousands of eggs are their one shot. Um, another example is the agave plant that lives in the desert. And what the agave do, will do is it'll spend most of its life uh, massing nutrients, and then if there is a particularly wet year in the desert, it'll send up one flowering stalk, send off a ton of seeds, and after it's done that, it dies. So this is favored in harsh conditions where um, even adults are not favored to live that long, so the best chance that an organism has to pass on its genetic material is to get everything ready, wait for just the right condition, send out a ton of offspring, and let them be, and hopefully nature will take to letting one of those grow up. In contrast to this, we have got iteroparity, which basically beats the competition in a stable environment. And this is many tries. So example of iteroparity would be humans. We have the possibility to have uh, babies every, you know, nine or ten months. Not that we should, but we have the potential to. But there are a lot of organisms that have a small litter of babies every season or every year or every couple of years. And the idea behind this is that if the parents take care of the children, the children have got a fairly good chance of growing up. And this also happens in environments where there are resources fairly abundant, so it's not like the agave that has to wait until things are just right. You know, conditions are generally pretty stable in places where the animals exhibit iteroparity. So those are the two extremes. Remember, everything or most organisms fall somewhere in between one of those two extremes. Now, with these extremes, there are always trade-offs. And the big trade-off in reproduction is quantity versus quality. Most animals do one of two things. Either they have a ton of offspring and don't take care of them because they put all their energy into producing tons of eggs or tons of babies or whatever, and there is such a great quantity of all of, of uh, offspring that the parents couldn't possibly take care of all of them. So you are putting out a ton of numbers knowing that a ton of them are going to die off, but due to like the laws of chance, some of them are going to survive. So that would be one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is quality, where you only have one or two babies, but you put a lot of energy into raising them to ensure their uh, success in life. So quantity versus quality, major trade-off. Either have lots of babies, knowing that several will die, hoping that a few will live, or have a couple babies and put the energy into raising them. Now, with all of this population growth, having babies, babies dying, there's basically two major ways that populations are regulated. Now we've talked about population density, which is how many organisms live in an area, 
and populations can be regulated in one of two ways. There's density independent regulation and what this is is the birth rate of a population goes up or down independent of any other factors. So a density independent factor would be an example of a hurricane. Hurricane comes through, it wipes out a ton of the population. It doesn't really do anything to the birth rate. Um, it kills indiscriminately. It's coming on shore whether there are organisms in the way or not. So density independent regulation is generally associated with natural disasters and doesn't have a whole lot to do with the actual density of the population. It's going to do its thing either way. Now, density dependent regulation is a situation that kills more as the density of a population becomes higher. Um, I'll give you several examples in the next slide, but get that, uh, I guess, juxtaposition or contrast. Density independent, natural disasters or something like that that kills indiscriminately. Density dependent relies on the population density to go up before it does more damage. So, like I said, uh, density dep dependent regulation depends on the population size going up and it's an example of a large-scale negative feedback cycle wherein as population goes up certain factors will increase that decreases the birth rate which is going to bring down the population size and then as the population size gets small the birth rates are going to go back up and the population will go back up towards that carrying capacity line until it hits that carrying capacity line and then the feedback cycle will take hold again. So density dependent regulation is going to work like a negative feedback cycle and some of the factors that work in density dependent regulation are as follows. Uh, you got competition for resources. So if you've got more organisms living in an area obviously there's going to be greater competition for the same amount of resources which means the environment will eventually be able to support fewer animals and lower your population. Predation. Predators have got a lot better chance of catching prey when there's a lot of prey around. So more prey equals greater predation, lowers the population size. Got toxic waste. There are some organisms that actually produce toxic waste and at certain concentrations their own toxic waste kills them. Example of this would be the yeast that's used in brewing and winemaking. Um, those yeast, they can handle alcohol concentrations up to about 13%, so they will happily go along metabolizing sugars and making alcohol until they get to that 13-ish percent mark, at which point their own toxic waste kills them off. You've got intrinsic factors, which is just like inborn traits. It's been shown that in some mice, even if given an abundant food supply and ample space, once the population gets to a certain size, um, hormonal changes take place, the immune system becomes weaker, and the mice begin to die off just naturally. It's territoriality. If you got to fight for resources, the more organisms around, the greater the increase in territoriality, which is also going to regulate your population size. And finally, the big one is disease. And usually when we think of disease or density-dependent regulation, this is the one you think of because it's easy, easy to visualize. The more people or the more organisms you have in a space, the more easily a disease can be transmitted from one to the other. So obviously that is going to knock your population down as well. And final slide for the day is population dynamics. Population dynamics is the study of fluctuations in population size where they go up and they go down and they go up and they go down. Uh, for a long time it was thought that bigger animals, especially mammals, population sizes didn't fluctuate but many studies have shown that um, especially for big mammals population sizes do fluctuate from year to year and in uh, cases where there is like a predator prey relationship there is generally a link between the sizes in the population so over here on the right we've got a pretty famous study that's well known um, it is a study of the populations of moose and wolves living together and what research has found is when the wolf population is high the moose population is low which makes sense because you've got a lot of wolves preying on the moose but when the <clears throat> when you get a switch and the moose population goes up the wolf population may go down now you're going to get a die off because if you've got let's say a lot of wolves and not so many moose there is not enough prey for all the wolves so the wolves are going to begin to die off and as the wolf number decreases then the moose are better able to survive so their population goes up. So predator prey, just recognize that the two populations track with one another. When the predator population is high, usually the prey population goes low and then as a result, they flip flop and that cycle will continue on into perpetuity. And 
that's it. That is our quick intro to life histories and density regulation in populations.